Live Long and Die Laughing, Chapter 42, Haitian Nation Inspiration. Contrary to rumors, I didn't die in Haiti. Although I did have pneumonia prior to the trip, which made me feel as though I was dying, nevertheless, I got over the pneumonia and had an eye-opening time among the Haitian people. I've never seen such poverty. People bathing and washing their clothes in filthy streams that run in front of their little shacks. Donkeys hauling stuff everywhere. Ladies carrying heavy bags with bowls on their heads. Piles of trash on cluttered streets and dirt, debris, and decay everywhere. The first night we stayed at the nicest hotel in Port-au-Prince. In the United States, this hotel might be known as a motel two and a half. But for Haiti, it was plush. The air conditioning didn't come on until 11 o'clock at night. When the city turned on the electricity... The government arbitrarily decides when that will be, and then only for eight hours at a time. The remainder of the day, the hotel used a generator, but only for lights, not air conditioning. I was raised in Texas. People will go without food before they'll go without air conditioning. You can actually live longer without food in Texas than you can without air conditioning. And Haiti is hot, even hotter than Texas. They informed me, after we arrived, that we had a six-hour drive the next day to the ministry project, where I would meet my sponsored child, Nestle. I had no idea what was ahead of me. First of all, it wasn't six hours, it was eight, which made it 16 hours round trip. We averaged 10 miles an hour because of the roads. To call anything a road in Haiti is a major stretch. What they really have are non-road donkey paths, rocky, muddy, river-crossing trails. I don't mean crossing over the river. I mean crossing through it. The four-wheeler in which I was traveling was a lot like being in a rock tumbler. The road, for lack of a better term, was dirt, rocks, dried out or flooded creek beds, mud and dust. Very little was paved, and what was paved had decayed to such a point that it was mostly potholes, rocks, and rubble. We had four flat tires and then got stuck in knee-deep mud, and that was just the first day. While we were stuck in the mud, something unusual happened. People came out of the bushes, seemingly from nowhere, carrying the same crude hose they were using to till the dry ground. They dug right in and helped us out of the mud. The Haitian people are very gracious and kind, and they have the brightest smiles you've ever seen. Beautiful people. They know nothing about deodorant, however, but you get used to it after a few days. Before long, you can't tell if it's them or you. Our drive to the ministry project took forever, but it was an interesting feast for the eyes. The 16-hour journey was like watching a three-dimensional panoramic movie of life from some other planet. I recognized nothing. I related to nothing. I couldn't imagine such poverty. Mile after mile, hut after hut, the faces changed, but the plot stayed the same. I strained to look into their eyes and imagine what their lives must be like. Under the blaring Haitian sun, life seemed so harsh, so desolate, so uninviting. But at night, everything changes. There's no TV and very little electricity, so the people go to bed shortly after dark and are up at daylight. They line the streets at dusk, preparing what little food they'll have that evening and sharing it with their less fortunate neighbors. On nights, when they have nothing to eat, others share with them. It's a nightly block party, and it happens every night. Unfortunately, they speak French. And I don't know French. I would have jumped right out of the van and joined their fun had I known French. Haitians are enthusiastic and expressive people. At least they seem to be. They look like they were having fun and not a sign of electricity anywhere. They were all talking about something. And it was very important. Yard after yard, neighbor after neighbor. The whole town was on the street. The kids were playing games with sticks and rocks. And the parents were sitting around fires on their front porches, cooking and talking with each other. 
The suppertime flames flickered down the road, creating crude street lamps. I rolled the window down and strained to hear what they were saying. They were all talking at once, children laughing, babies crying, men telling jokes, and mothers watching over everybody. I wanted to remember their faces as the flames flashed, and my mind took a mental picture. I could hear their loud, strong voices and their white teeth sparkling, hands flying around their dark faces as they told their tales. Then in the next yard, heads thrown back in laughter, people slapping each other on the back. I didn't understand a single word, but I know what I saw. Community, family, people taking care of each other. We finally arrived at my sponsored child's home. Not surprisingly, he was extremely poor, like the rest of the country. A strapping 14-year-old boy, Nestle lives with his uncle, aunt, grandma, and many cousins. The thatched roof shacks they share are about the size of a small American bedroom. Nestle's uncle is a farmer. That's how he gets enough food to feed his family. Nestle's grandma is 80 years of age and blind. She has a little one-room shack not far from the family's. Nestle sleeps in her shack. I played soccer with my sponsored child and his classmates. I should say I played at soccer and for only about two minutes. By then, I nearly had a heart attack and had to quit. I'm out of shape and proud of it. Coupled with the fact that I'm getting over pneumonia and it was so hot you could fry an egg on my chin, my stamina was in short supply. Later, I got the kids singing. Of course, they speak French, so my communication was limited. They did understand my goofy faces. They tried to make the twisted lip face I'm known for. They knew a lot of religious songs, but I'd never heard any of them. I was trying to get them to sing He Touched Me so I could tell Bill, but they were staring at me like I just got off a spaceship. Clay Cross, who also went on the trip, tapped me on the shoulder and said, let's try the Macarena. They knew that one. They all started doing the Macarena. I got into it. I mean, I cut a rug. I'm not saying I was on the rhythm or in the pocket, as they say, but I had a good time. I was the Macarena maniac. I took my fake, ugly teeth with me, and when I put them in my mouth, the Haitian kids loved it. But while I was playing soccer, I fell. My ugly teeth, which were in my pocket, were shattered. But the children laughed with glee when I fell. Hearing their laughter was worth losing my ugly teeth. Perhaps the main thing I discovered while in Haiti is how spoiled I am. Okay, so you knew that. My Haitian trip reminded me that I should be more thankful. There are so many things I have taken for granted in the past. The opportunity to eat anytime I want. An air-conditioned home, a hot shower, clean sheets, a roof over my head, the ability to pay taxes, and a government that is a long way from perfect and at times downright stupid but is still the best thing going. And right near the top of my new list of things for which I am grateful, paved roads. When we got back to the U.S., I was amazed by our pavement. It's so smooth. I wanted to kiss it.